Good evening. My lecture tonight will be in two parts. Uh, the early first part will do, deal with the early period, historically, in the life of the Buddha in the following centuries, and the second part will deal with the revival or resurgence of Buddhism in the 19th and 20th centuries. In this lecture, I will deal with a little bit of bi biography and a bit of geography. Um, I will offer alternate approaches to Eurocentric views of Asian history and to world system or other approaches that pay scant attention to the intangibles of socio-religious evolution. I intend to lead you on a tour, not too long or tiring, I hope, of geographies of the mind in a cluster of themes that do not impose any homogeneous theory. For many of you, this tour, meandering through 2,000, two and a half thousand years and over several continents, may lead to unfamiliar territories, and my ideas may uh, go against received ideas of Buddhism. The questions that I intend to raise are not simple, and they do not have simple answers. There is no reason that they should. Rather than glossing over the complexities of human history, human culture, and humanity, I feel that we need to recognize them. What is Asia, and how could the Buddha have invented it, or did he discover it? Did he cross the seas in a canoe? Did he navigate jungles and traverse deserts on elephant back or camel hump? Or did he travel in the twinkling of an eye by magic power? Did the Buddha invent Asia? To go further with this question, we need to examine the meaning of the vexed term Asia, something which I believe as a recently arrived outsider, is especially relevant in Australia today. The definition of Asia in historical and even social terms is not as straightforward as it may seem, and its reference and meanings have changed over the centuries. The word Asia comes from the Greek, although it seems to go back much earlier, perhaps to ancient languages like Hittite or Akkadian. In four 140 BC, Herodotus used the term Asia to refer to Anatolia, or also to the Persian Empire. The perspective was, of course, from Greece. Uh, Herodotus was very close in time to the Buddha. Does my question then become, did the Buddha invent Anatolia? At the time of the Buddha, India and the known world was called Jambudvipa the rose apple continent. The boundaries of this continent were fluid and the territory of Jambudvipa expanded with Buddhism to include China, Korea and Japan, Siam, Cambodia and Burma, and effectively any polity or state that professed Buddhism. Geography was handmaiden to ideology as it very often is. Buddhas and ideal rulers, the universal or Chakravartin emperors, could arise only in Jambudvipa, according to the dogmatic texts. Uh, therefore, for Buddhism to spread, that area had to become a part of Jambudvipa. Or for a king to claim great power and universal status, uh, he had to be in Jambudvipa, and so also an empress. Even at one point, the empress of China had to rule in Jambudvipa in order to be a universal empress. This is a complex question. Let me emphasize uh, for the moment that Asia is a European term and that the Buddha could not possibly have invented Asia in, that, in the sense we know it today. But in metaphorical terms, we can suggest that the Buddha set ideas in motion 
and initiated processes that led to some of the earliest knowable regional and pan-Asian networks, to the first self-conscious identities that transcended ethnicity, language, and nationality, empowering people with a sense of shared participation. Although I ask how one man influenced Asia so profoundly, I do not mean to endorse any kind of great man theory. That, as Car Thomas Carlyle put it in the 19th century, the history of the world is but the biography of great men. Nor do I propose that Buddhism was the central concern of Asian societies, or that Buddhists or Buddhist thought were primary, consistent, or constant agents in Asian history. I do suggest that Buddhism was one of the actors, one of the important actors on the stage of history, and that we need to consider its role and give fresh thought to it. Uh, part one, man and superman, the figure of the Buddha. For over a century, scholars have debated about the nature of the historical Buddha. Let's see, this won't stay still. Okay. For over a century, scholars have debated about the nature of the historical Buddha. The epithet is taken for granted. We should not forget, however, that the idea, the very idea of the historical Buddha is a relatively recent uh, concept and that it grew up in relation to the quest for a historical Jesus, which began in the 18th century and was the subject of a book by Albert Schweitzer. Rather than historical, the Buddha conjured up in late 19th century thought is historicist, a demythologized byproduct of 19th and 20th century ideas which saw myth, magic, and wonders uh, very unfavorably. The historical Buddha was constructed from the leftovers to contrast with the mythic and idealized Buddha of tradition. In my work, I prefer to put this Humpty Dumpty back together again and to suggest that it is the integral Buddha who acted in history, who has acted in history from the beginning to the present. It is, for me, the integral Buddha, by which I mean both the historical and the mythic Buddha taken together. There need be no real contradiction. It is this integral Buddha who matters. Who was the Buddha? Ask, and you'll receive a variety of answers. The problem lies with how our sources have been assessed and exploited, with our methodologies and their presuppositions. We have a limited number of sources. These are mainly textual. Uh, they come from several centuries at the very earliest after the life of the Buddha himself. We don't possess his birth certificate. Uh, we don't. We have some archaeological evidence, epigraphic evidence of where the Buddha trod, but we do not have a great deal of historical evidence in the modern sense. So most of what is written about the Buddha centers on a body of texts, and how we use these texts uh, determines our answers. Biographies of the Buddha have been read as biographies in the Western sense, as historical accounts, or treated as hagiographies, exaggerations, or, or as myths. One 19th century European scholar at the dawn of studies of Buddhism in the West even interpreted uh, the Buddha as a solar myth. It makes better sense to try to understand the aims of the compilers of these texts. Did they mean to make an historical account? Did they mean to write an accurate biography? Or did they want to teach and to inspire? 
And I should add that the Buddha did not write a word in his time teaching and the preservation and transmission of teaching was entirely oral. So his words were not written down until some centuries later and the oral tradition persisted in its importance. The man who became the Buddha was born in a small kingdom in the foothills of the Himalaya mountains over 2,000 years ago. We do not know his exact date and there has been some debate about it, but let us say about 2,500 to 400 years ago. He renounced the throne at the age of 29 and went into the world in search of the truth in a quest of an end to human suffering. That was one of the ways that Indian philosophy at the time viewed the uh, questions of philosophy was the question of the unsatisfactory nature of life, of impermanence, of the fact that life was not an easy thing. So the quest, philosophical quest, the religious quest, was to seek a solution to the question of suffering uh, rather than to engage, although that was also done in elaborate explanations of the universe or ontologies. After six years of searching, the uh, man we know as Gautama achieved awakening, seated beneath a tree which became known as the awakening tree, the Bodhi tree. From that time on, the awakened one traveled on foot back and forth over a restricted e region of North India, now defined by modern Nepal and the modern Indian states of Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. That is all. He went no further. He established a monastic order of monks and nuns and lived for 80 years, tires, tirelessly teaching the truths he had discovered. The world into which the Buddha was born, for the benefit and for the happiness of the many, as the texts assure us, was a wide world of expanding civilizations and societies, not only in the Indian subcontinent but beyond. A world of trade, a world of cultural exchange was in formation during this period. As you can see, the trade routes were uh, expanding and linking, spanning the continents. Alexander of Macedonia had already led his troops, accompanied by teams of experts from Mediterranean Europe to Persia and to the frontiers of India. The world was in contact. Perhaps globalization had already begun. What did the Buddha teach? This is not the place for a detailed sermon or an analysis of his teachings. Briefly, he taught how to recognize the problem of human suffering and its causes and how to end suffering. He taught moral causality and ethical code and mental cultivation or meditation, if you like. He claimed to have discovered a natural order of things and to interpret realities that were not created by a god or any such supreme being. His teaching, or rather the teaching of awakened ones in general, is summed up by the verse, not to commit any bad deeds, to accomplish that which is good, to cleanse one's mind. This is the teaching of the Buddhas. During the first several centuries, the monastic order actively spread across India and beyond. There was an idea, I suppose we could call it missionary zeal, if that didn't have a kind of negative connotation in English, uh, there was a spirit to transmit the Buddha's teaching to make it available to people uh, far and wide. Even very early texts give evidence for this during the lifetime of the Buddha. In one text set on the eve of the Buddha's final passing, the Buddha himself predicted the future of one of the cities, Pataliputra, then a trading town which went on to become the capital 
of the mighty Maurya dynasty, uh, the seat of the emperor Asoka, who we will come to later, who had a very significant role in the spread and dissemination of Buddha and we can say of the formation of Asian connections. Very early texts reveal connections with regions beyond the heartland of, of India, Magadha, to the west and to the south. A later generation of texts took the Buddha himself to the western coast of India, to the northwest and to Mathura, then across the Indus River into Afghanistan and Kashmir and then to Gandhara or also to the island of Lanka, Sri Lanka or Ceylon beyond the confines of India proper. In still later texts, the Buddha traveled to Burma and to the Mon Thai principalities of Southeast Asia. Wherever he traveled, the Blessed One left objects of reverence, hair relics or footprints as souvenirs of his visit. Every pagoda in Arakan, the Shan states, the Mon lands, Burma, Laos or Thailand has an origin myth that invests the monument with the power of the Buddha through his visits, his predictions, his relics, and his images. This be, uh, in this way, an interrelated sacred landscape was created, networks of pilgrimage. The Northern Thai Chronicle, called The Lord Crosses the World, weaves the local accounts into an extended narrative of the Buddha's travels across Thailand and up to the Mekong River. So in the later texts, the Buddha becomes very well-traveled indeed, and there are, of course, various ways to interpret uh, these. They should not necessarily simply be dismissed as, as legend or hocus-pocus. We can see them as exemplifying the travel of the Dharma, of the Buddha's teaching, through the Buddha himself, uh, traveling to these distant places. And in fact, travel and pilgrimage are built into the Buddhist mindset. One ancient text gives seven reasons why awakened ones travel. These include to convert and to satisfy the residents, to demonstrate not a particular place, to fill different regions with shrines and to appease through their presence disasters such as epidemics and drought. Monks and disciples travel for 15 reasons, including from compassion to see wonders in other lands and to pay homage to shrines. The role of the monastics was flexible and broadened with time. As monks became monastery accountants, construction foremen, architects, court ritualists, and court advisors. That is to say, the idea that the Buddhist monks and nuns lived an entirely secluded life, uh, dedicated only to meditation and to their own uh, liberation, uh, doesn't really work when we look at the historical evidence. There was great diversity, and if you have monasteries, some of the monks have to, to run them, and that goes on to the present day. There has to be a balance between these activities. Within several centuries of his death, these are some examples of how travel and pilgrimage have been, imagine, uh, have been imagined. I'd like to point out that although this talk seems to be largely about chaps and great men, uh, there have been uh, females, nuns, who have played significant roles in the historical records. Uh, my main work on that deals with inscriptions that give evidence of actual historical nuns. Here also we have the fact that the very uh, sapling of the Tree of Awakening sent by Emperor Ashoka to Sri Lanka, to the king in Sri Lanka, was taken by a nun, his own daughter. So the idea of travel crossing the oceans, of going on pilgrimage, 
is, we can say, very strongly developed. And the presence of the Buddha invoked through his footprint, for example, throughout Asia was very important. Within several centuries of his death, the Buddha's teachings had spread beyond the confines of India, and within 500 years, they were beginning to find a foothold in China. At its height, Buddhism flourished across much of Asia and was universal, shared by Indians, Indo-Greeks, Parthians, Sogdians, and other Central Asians, not to speak of Koreans, Chinese, Vietnamese, and Japanese, and then Southeast Asians, or Tibetans, Tanguts, and Mongolians. Monks and nuns journeyed by land and by sea, establishing networks of intellectual exchange that for centuries linked Asian societies, inspiring literature and philosophy, art and architecture, and social and ritual practice, affecting conceptions of time, cosmology, and governance. During the Tang dynasty in the 6th, 7th, 8th century, about 600 Buddhist monks, mostly Chinese, but also Korean and other nationalities, traveled to India on pilgrimage. Later, during the Song Dynasty, over 400 monks set out for the Holy Land. I have noted that the Buddha moved on foot. He did not travel by animal or by vehicle. But in his later voyages, he flew through the skies with his monks, with their red robes looking like an elegant flock of ruddy geese, as the texts express it. And the Buddha, as an embodiment of ideas, traveled in other forms and other means through the circulation of relics, images, and scriptures. Relics, the ashes and bones of the Buddha gathered after his cremation, were deposited within opulent vessels reliquaries fashioned from crystal, silver, and gold, and studded with precious stones. These, in turn, were enshrined in earthen mounds called stupas. The stupas, faced with brick or decorated stone slabs, were some of the earliest religious structures of India and came to be some of the greatest monuments of Asia. One of the reasons of that Buddhism spread is that it adapted to local ideas and conditions. Uh, in the mural paintings, the Buddha would be depicted as, the, as, as a member of the particular tribe or people who had made these murals. So in Thailand, the Buddha looks like a Thai. In Tibetan murals, the Buddha looks like a Tibetan. And here in China, the uh, reliquaries look like a Chinese coffin.